Okay, so hello and welcome to my presentation. <coughs> my, not, my name is Christina Quest. Um, at daytime, I'm a normal embedded systems developer, but at nighttime or something, I like uh, playing IT security CTFs or IT security war games, or go to security conferences to find out um, how to hack devices. And I felt like talking to my colleagues, um, many of my colleagues didn't um, imagine how the attacker thinks like what the attack vectors are, what, what the view of an attacker is, and I wanted to bring this to a developer conference, this knowledge. Um, okay. So um, this is my agenda. Um, in short, I will talk about software and hardware attacks and um, tell you some example attack stories I've seen in the last years. And um, let's start with what is IoT? So IoT were um, traditionally more analog devices like your light bulb or your garage um, opener or your baby monitor, which are now connected to a network. So often those devices are rather power constrained and memory constrained and oftentimes less secured because we don't care about security. Well, somebody hacked my IoT um, light bulb. Why should I care? One of the reasons we saw in 2016, for example, there was um, this Mirai botnet, which was mainly uh, created out of IoT devices, which now started to attack. Um, they did a distributed denial of service attack on uh, Dundanas, so that DNS requests to some major websites like Netflix or Spotify or Airbnb um, failed. And the thing is, those devices are still out there. This botnet still exists, and we don't know how many devices there are. So your device could be one of the one attacking. And the problem is not just, um, we cannot pinpoint, like this manufacturer is um, to be um, held responsible because there's a supply chain which is rather large. We have the PCB um, vendor. Then we have the BSP, the board support um, package vendors like Marvel and Broadcom which create their SDK for you to work on. Then there's the ODM, the original device manufacturer which puts his own SDK on top of it. Um, then a reseller which puts his name on this whole package and the OEM, the original um, equipment manufacturer. So you have so many steps, you have so many touching hands, um, hands touching the code which introduce bugs as well. And also an embedded device has many, um, a, a large attack surface. It can be connected over a wireless connection, um, the firmware process can take over, place over a wireless connection for example, it can provide a web server. Uh, or mobile applications. So you have many, many places where you can actually uh, try to attack. Um, so let's talk about so software. So what does the attacker do? First, um, he does the same that a normal embedded systems developer does when he gets a device and no documentation. He basically tries to understand how this thing works. He tries to reverse engineer. He inspects the components, the data sheets, um, looks at the firmware update process and looks whether he can tamper with that a bit. He looks at the flash content, which is already on the device. So like if the firmware is um, some well-known and well-documented architecture like ARM or PowerPC or MIPS, it's rather an easier task. Then you have ASICs, which are, let's say, average, easy. And then the most complicated are FPGAs, because the FPGA is just hardware. So the vendor can have put any program, any um, bit stream on it, and it's hard to figure out what he actually put on it. And the more PCB layers your device, your board has, the more complicated it gets um, to analyze. And then the attacker, he would um, tamper with the firmware update process. He would try to rewrite some parts of the memory. Um, also um, use the JTAG channel, for example, or other debug channels to have a feedback and establish a communication channel over serial or JTAG to see what kind of effects his changes have. So if you want to analyze the firmware, if you want to analyze the software running on this board, is, um, what, where do you get this firmware? Like in most cases you can dump it from the flash memory, or otherwise you can look around whether you can find the firmware on the FTP server of the manufacturer. There are also FTP index sites where you can search. Some devices come with CDs or DVDs um, where you can search for the firmware. Or a um, very good attack vector is um, looking at Wireshark. So if the firmware update process takes place over an unencrypted um, connection without TLS, then you 
can kind of dump um, the firmware out of the data which was transmitted. Um, or if it's not just the blob, um, you can analyze the firmware and look at the firmware update routine and see how, um, where, which part of the binary blob you just dumped is mapped in memory later. Furthermore, um, in firmware, you sometimes find um, code or strings and you can search on the known websites like code.google.com or sourceforge.net or something. But or you can recognize some open source so software which was just taken from a Chinese manufacturer and put into this box. Then, yeah, you can decompile, you can recompile, you can change some values, you can fast the device, so um, send random data to it and see whether it crashes. And for example, if the firmware is not stripped, um, so it has some de debug symbols in it, or if you find human readable strings in it, it's easier. But once you get the hang of it, if you're really good in reversing, it doesn't uh, keep you from reversing this anyways. So what, what kind of software do we use? One of them we see um, on the top right um, on the slide, this is um, a screenshot which I took from e IDA. So IDA is like a more or less a standard which is used nowadays by reversers. It's, um, it has a nice GUI and lets, <coughs> lets you look at the um, code flow. Then if you are more into open source um, command line tools, there's Radar2, which is being developed. And I heard the new up and coming as Binary Ninja, but I didn't try it out yet. Um, then for finding bugs in your software, you can use Flaw Finder or the Metasploit framework. Uh, Metasploit is more, it's like a set or a database of exploits which you can just launch on a, tar on a target, even if it's remote, and um, it will automatically perform those attacks. Then there are some tools for firmware analysis, like FirmWorker. FirmWorker, um, it uses Binwalk, which will go through a binary blob and it will be searching for headers, for example, which it can recognize, and then it will print you the files which is possibly found in this binary blob and you can extract them. It uses CPU, CPU rec to recognize the architecture the firmware is written for. And it has also the firmware analy analysis toolkit or a rather academic project, the fact, the firmware analysis and comparison tool. And if your IoT device exposes a, a web server, um, you can use the usual tools like SQL map to find SQL injections or SSLIs um, in order to see whether you, you configured um, your server right for SSL or Go bus Buster. For an extensive uh, list, I recommend um, you to check out the OWASP um, website, the Open Web Application Security Project, which um, kind of has um, more extensive knowledge and um, put it on their list. And for um, interfacing with your device, you would use the usual ones, the, for example, GDB and OpenOCD. So in terms of hardware, um, there are three kinds of attacks. You can have non-invasive attacks, you can have semi-invasive attacks, and fully invasive attacks. So for non-invasive attacks, you don't have a direct chip access. You only have the external signals and you try to um, work with those. For example, um, you can search for the UART or JTAG and try to interface with your device and get control over it in this manner. Or if the write protection security fuse is not enabled, um, you can change the bootloader, you can patch it and let it load your own firmware. You can do hardware fuzzing. Like I would um, estimate that one out of 10 um, hardware or crashes, or do you know what fuzzing is? Fuzzing is um, you're sending random data to your hardware and see whether it crashes. And I guess like one uh, out of 10 um, crashes, you can actually trans um, you can create an exploit out of that. And then there are other side channel attacks like timing attacks. For example, if you have a computation which depends on the value of the secret data. For example, you, are, um, cal you, are, you have your secret and you have the user input and you are comparing the first character and uh, do a breakout of your while loop if it's not correct, then the second character and so on. So it means like the more uh, characters you have right as an attacker, um, the more time it will take for the device to respond. Um, and so you can brute force one character after another in this manner. Also cache miss and cache hit times have a huge timing difference. So, which is also used for example in Spectral and in those um, cache timing attacks. So you can always find a pattern um, 
in those different timing differences. So basically, in this kind of attack, you trace instructions, you, ac you access register values, you can modify media con uh, memory content or extract code and data, but you're not actually physically opening up the chip. Um, yeah, there are other um, non-invasive attacks like side channel attacks. For example, hardware glitching is when you apply a voltage which is too high or too low, or higher or lower than what your chip originally expected. And you hope for funny effects or that your chip um, calculates any manner which is not expected and makes a mistake and you can use that to hack it or get more information about the secret. There's also um, uh, glitching attacks where it can alter the clock period during the execution of a program and um, have a similar effect. Then there's power analysis. Um, if the power consumption of your device depends on the secret data which is computed at that moment, um, you can get information from that and I will be presenting a tag on that um, later. There's simple power analysis where you're directly looking at the power traces, but there's also differential power analysis where you kind of correlate the power traces you took. And if your um, correlation criterion is right, you get a peak um, in your um, line. There's also AM radiation channel attacks or acoustic channels. So all the side effects of a computation, you can try to find a pattern and get more information about the secret. Um, then there are semi-invasive attacks where you actually decap um, a package and then you can um, shine infrared light onto this chip and with a certain probability a gate which switches will emit a photon. Um, and in this manner you can find a location for your attack. For example, the picture we saw before, here you see a emitted photon from, from your chips. And you can assume that the brighter areas are uh, gates which are switching a lot. For example, the brightest spot you see on the left would be the clock or um, up there, for, for example, memory address um, accesses. But um, the problem with laser glitching is um, you, don't, you have an unknown timing. It's more or less trial and error because you're shooting this laser on a big area and you hope that um, the chip does a um, an error in his um, calculation. So if semi-invasive attacks didn't work, um, then you can try fully invasive attacks, which require much more effort, but you have a 100% uh, success rate. So you can use a focus ion beam to remove or put material on the chip and for example, create micro probing, um, yeah, probing pads. So basically you can analyze any pad or any signal in your chip you want. But obviously it's much more, it costs much more, it takes more time and knowledge to do that. But um, fully invasive attacks are mainly used if um, you have countermeasures put in place in hardware and you want to circumvent it. So um, mainly for the um, non-invasive attacks, um, those are the tools which are used. Um, the oscilloscope, uh, for just looking at logic signals or a logic analyzer if you want to analyze UART, for example. Then for JTAG, there are good uh, open source alternatives as well. For example, the GoodFed um, created by Teres Goodspeed, or um, I've heard many good things about the Black Magic probe. Then for the side channel attacks I uh, mentioned, like uh, power glitching and so on. Um, two years ago, you had to make your own set up uh, using an FPGA because that was the only thing which would get the timing right. But nowadays um, you can take the chip, chip whisperer to do um, the glitching and the power analysis for you out of the box. You can use um, the phase tensor which is, which is based on the good fat to do some host side uh, Python um, scripting and to fast test your device, uh, your USB device drivers. And if you want to do SDR, software defined radio, there are the HackRF and actually more devices which I didn't list here um, that you can use. The uh, RF is a great Scott Gadgets device which can send and receive from one megahertz to six gigahertz. So um, let's go to some real world attacks. This was theory, now let's go to practice. So there was this nice video which I really recommend to you, which is called Hack All Things, um, 20 devices in 45 minutes, where they presented how they um, yeah, owned um, 20 devices um, really fast and in a very entertaining manner. 
So one of the common attacks was just connecting to UART, and oftentimes you just boot into a console where you have um, no password or a password that you can guess easily, and you can replace the um, image the device is running um, using this console. Sometimes the UART is uh, um, populated, sometimes it's not. But even if it's not populated, you can easily just put your own connector on it, solder it on the board. Um, what else they did was, for example, um, change some parameters of the kernel command line. Like, um, if, uh, for example, like when you locked yourself out of your computer, you boot it up and you put init equals bin sh um, into the kernel command line and would directly boot up in a, into a shell. And from here you can yeah, mount devices, you can replace the uh, image and put your own firmware. Also often bootloaders, they um, try to execute a pre-configured script and you can just, if you have access to the memory, you can just put a script with the same name um, instead of that and it will boot up with your firmware. Um, one attack which, um, if those two don't work, you can try to short the pins of uh, the NAND which contains the bootloader and maybe one out of ten times it will boot up into a, a corrupted U-boot environment where you have control and you can again replace the firmware. Because the thing for the attackers, you just have to get it right one out of 100 times and you, you uh, hack to your device. As a defender, you actually have to get it right 100 times or your device uh, is corrupted. Um, sometimes they analyze the firmware and um, they found hard-coded or base64 uh, encoded usernames and passwords in the binary. Yeah, base64 is not um, encryption, it's just encoding. It's basically easy to decipher. Also brute forcing worked on some devices because um, many manufacturers would just use root and um, manufacturer name as a password so you can easily get in. Um, what else? Um, they um, had access to an EMC, or they wrote a SUID binary uh, on the EMC, which uses a similar protocol to whatever an SD card reader is using, and afterwards they ex executed the SUID binary on the device and um, got root that, that way. Other devices, um, they took user input unsanitized and put it into a system um, function, for example. And obviously, if you put um, semicolon, reboot, semicolon, your device will uh, reboot. And you can put any system command or batch command you want in that. Often, um, WEP or Wi-Fi password fields um, of the configuration page were not sanitized. They would just take whatever you give to it, or network folder names, who would put um, any um, bash commands into a network folder name, right? They are trustworthy. Um, or URL parameters. Sometimes um, they could just execute a command by just passing it um, to an URL. Um, also, if the firmware update takes place over an unencrypted channel, for example, just plain HTTP or FTP, it can be intercepted. They can put a man-in-the-middle attack in place. So you send your firmware, I modify it, and I send it further to the device you want to update. And well, I control the device now. Um, then this one was an, a rather academic um, attack. They attacked a PLC, a programmable logic controller, which is used a lot in industry. And um, they tried to downgrade to an older firmware version, um, but it didn't work, it didn't um, let them do that. They searched for JTAG uh, or something similar, they didn't find it on the board. They tried injecting code um, on the web page of the manufacturer to do a firmware update and um, put their firmware on this device, but it didn't work. They assumed that um, maybe the firmware was, um, there was a checksum over the firmware or the firmware was signed, so that's why it was not, not taken. So they ended up actually modifying the board. Um, so the, the um, flash chip which contained the first stage bootloader um, was write protected using a pin and they desoldered this pin and could um, alter any data on this, um, on this flash chip. Um, then there was an attack um, on an electronic um, safe lock by Plor, which was presented at DEF CON 24. So what he had was um, a metal box 
and outside of this metal box you would have a keypad, a buzzer and a battery and inside behind steel doors there was a lock, an MCU, an EEPROM and a bolt motor. So and between those two inside and outside there was just one hole to pass the wire through. And the good thing was that um, inside the MCU and the EEPROM they were connected by a direct line which was um, connected to a pull, a pull up. Um, so every time the device would reach a zero from the EEPROM, the um, voltage drop over the pull up would be higher, so he could record a higher current um, from, taken from the battery. So he could look at the power trace directly and say, okay, this one is a zero, this one is a one. Um, so how can you mitigate this kind of attack? Uh, yeah, so um, he would put any, um, any combination of numbers in there. He would um, read on the power trace um, the real secret which was read out from the EEPROM and he could put in that real secret afterwards. And you can um, protect yourself getting, uh, against those kind of attack by, for example, storing the hash instead of the real secret. So the attacker can just see the hash but it doesn't uh, force a he doesn't possibly know how the hash is calculated. And the second attack he did, so this easy attack didn't work on this block, um, so he did a timing attack, the one I described before. But you have this while loop where you compare the real secret uh, character to um, the user input one by one. And if there's one mismatch between characters encountered, you just break out of the loop. So you see it uh, in the power trace, the more characters he got right, the more digits um, he entered were correct, the longer it took for the uh, lock to respond. The problem in this case was, after five tries, um, he got locked out for 10 minutes. So brute forcing is uh, not so easy if you have to wait um, 10 minutes between the tries. But he got lucky, because normally in EEPROM, if you reset it, it would be reset to 0xff, so everything is one. But in this um, case, the EEPROM, Um, in this case, the EEPROM um, was an STM8S. Uh, so when you reset it, um, it was reset to zero. So he had a um, small time window of 500 microseconds after, um, or, and the count, the number of tries he performed was stored in EEPROM as well. So in order to write a new counter value, um, um, in the EEPROM the counter is set to zero before it's in, uh, initialized with the new value. So he had a 500 microseconds time frame after the write starts um, where this counter would be at zero. And if he applied the brownout voltage exactly at this moment in time, he would have gained infinite amount of um, tries because the counter would be reset to zero. And how can you mitigate against this attack? You can um, do constant uh, time comparisons. So basically you check all the values and then you give um, back whether um, the key code entered was correct or not. Or using hash secrets, so you actually have to wait for all the inputs from the user, you calculate and then you compare. So another question is how do you protect against that? Well, you can start with protecting against buffer overflows, stack overflows, um, heap overflows um, by comparing um, rigorously the buffer bounds. Um, don't use the known unsafe functions like gets or um, a string compare. Use the safer functions like fgets or string n compare which takes into account the buffer size. Then many compilers have secure compiler flags where you can disable um, or enable uh, the NX um, bit of the um, stack, so the stack becomes non-executable. You can activate the stack protection and so on. Also, um, build systems like Yocto and Buildroot will have um, flags for that, or you can enable it in your, there are some uh, secure options in, uh, in the kernel which you can enable via menu config. Then if your device um, so uh, has a web server, you should um, protect it against uh, SQL injections or cross-site scripting. Um, instead of blacklisting commands, you should whitelist your commands because you should never underestimate the um, creativity of an attacker. And never directly take user input and put it in system or something. 
um, always sanitize, always validate input coming from the user. Don't trust user input ever. Um, so if you do uh, firmware updates, always do it over a secure channel. Over do it, uh, always do it over TLS. Because otherwise, yeah, you can just man the middle of this um, update. Don't, don't do your own crypto. There are so many libraries which you can use um, where many eyes have looked over and which are um, tested or yeah, tested um, by many people. Don't rule your, uh, don't reinvent your crypto wheel. Maybe also implement an anti-rollback protection because often older firmwares have known bugs and um, a hacker could just um, reinstall an older version and um, apply the bugs, which were bugs two years ago, five years ago. Don't have hard-coded uh, secrets in your firmware. Always um, don't put usernames and passwords and so on as hard-coded secrets into your firmware or in non-protected storage. Like for example, EEPROM or Flash is not a safe storage. You should not put your keys in there. And if you do, or if your platform has a trusted execution environment, like Trustone for ARM or SGX um, for Intel, you should try to use that. Do identity management. Have different um, user, uh, have different accounts for web management and for remote console access. Um, don't put tokens and IDs and cookies into the URL because the attacker can just sniff it and replay it. Especially, and don't use tokens which can easily be guessed, like uh, sequential numbers, one, two, three, is not a secure token, or uh, current time is not a secure token, you can guess that. Um, use secure passwords for logins, um, for the UART, for example, and um, in the best case, you would have an individual secret for each device to deliver, because otherwise, one device gets hacked, all your devices are compromised. If you have one password per device, um, it's only this one. Then how many of us have um, unused language or shell interpreters in our devices? How many bash and dash and ash and zsh we have in these devices which we never use or libraries? The more attack surface an attacker has, the more um, tools he will find to exploit the device. So reducing the attack surface is one of the um, protections against hacking. Also disable ancient and, ancient and legacy, legacy protocols like FTP and Telnet. You would be surprised how many devices are out there which uh, still use that. Remove debugging interfaces because a hacker can also um, enter from there. And um, also manufacturers often have those management interfaces where um, they can do customer support, where they have either a very easily um, brute forcible password or no password at all. And oftentimes those um, interfaces uh, come with a root privilege. Yeah, if possible, tag um, third-party co code and SDKs. I don't know whether it's always possible. There are tools you can use for that. Um, keep your kernel, your frameworks, your libraries up to date. For example, using a package manager. Um, and check whether the tools you use um, are vulnerable. There are many vulnerability databases and you just enter um, the version of your, the tool you're using and see whether it has known vulner vulnerabilities. Or you use um, one of the tools um, recommended by OWASP um, in order to check um, third-party code or components or do some static analysis uh, on it and it will tell you um, where there might be possible um, bugs. And do threat modeling. Like, get in the shoes of an attacker and um, think how, through which port can he enter, like what are the possible vulnerable parts of your device. And once you, your device gets compromised, how do you treat with it? How do you, how do you contain the damage which is done? So if you didn't um, take away anything from this lecture, maybe those points. Um, so the main attack vectors for devices are crypto or the web interface or old firmware which still has bugs from 2000 um, or um, doing a firmware update process over an unencrypted channel or having clear text passwords in your binary um, or um, storing secrets in an um, unprotected place. And uh, so maybe it's a good idea to 
integrate security tests already in your continuous integration or your development cycle instead of in the end after your product is finished and ready to be shipped to find some security vulnerabilities and not have the time to fix it afterwards. And also there's basically not a way of how you can um, really secure your system 100%. It just makes it harder for the attacker um, or more so that he would have to invest more cost or more time in order to hack your device, but it's never impossible. You just try to get the bar as high as possible, so basically that we, he will attack the other manufacturer, not you. So do you have any, thank you for, for listening to me um, ranting, and um, do you have any questions? Um, so you recommended each device having um, their own secret um, for the keys and such, um, and I agree that's a great idea. Do you have any suggestions on tools to help manage like thousands or tens of thousands of keys across um, out there? I didn't try out anything, but um, maybe Mentor, since they have uh, tools to do firmware upgrade, update processes uh, securely, maybe they have a solution for that, but I don't know. You would have to talk to them. <coughs> yeah. Okay. I, I know more of the attacker side <laughs> than actually how to protect it, because it's really hard to protect. <laughs> okay, thank you. More questions? No? Okay, thank you. <laughs>